the Vox Markets podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Welcome to the podcast on Friday, the 9th of October, 2020. On the podcast today, John Clark, CEO of Gfinity, discusses their review of strategic partnership options and the launch of of a formal sales process. Also on the podcast, Anton de Plessis, CEO of Eris Resources, discusses their proposed acquisition of a lithium project in Germany, their name change and management restructure. Plus, Paul Hill, full-time investor and equity analyst, gives his view on the market. And we discuss the following companies, Equals, Roslyn Data Technologies, On the Market, Player and Imaging, Northbridge Industrial Services, Omega Diagnostics, and Chromet Group. Plus, also the podcast, Chris Bailey, founder of FinancialOrbit.com, covers news from the following companies, Tesco, London Stock Exchange, British Land, and Biffa. And as always, at the end of the podcast, I highlight two lists for you. The top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours, and the top five most liked RSs too. By the way, you can check out both these lists at voxmarkets.co.uk. We'll also see a host of other content. Check that out there at voxmarkets.co.uk and you'll see our COVID-19 index. Our biggest rise of the day is Gfinity, of course, and John's on the podcast up, well, 30% to 4.3. And biggest faller today is Tiziana Life Sciences down 8. 3%. Check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Vox Markets is an online community of investors that runs a free mobile and desktop platform that allows you to track news and updates about any UK listed company. Offering RNS push notifications, detailed charts, pricing data, and much more. Find out more at voxmarkets.co.uk forward slash app. And joining me on the podcast right now is John Clark, Chief Executive Officer of Gfinity, GFIN is ticker. John, thanks for joining me. Good morning. Always pleased to be here. Yeah, I expect you've had a busy morning, so uh, it's nice you can make the time because, of course, uh, you've released an RNS today uh, entitled Review of strategic partnership options and launch of formal sale process. So let's dig into that. I know when you go into this sort of uh, into this process, it's very strict, and uh, because the tick of a panel are very strict in what you can say. So I've got some questions here, and um, you know I can't I can't push you on any issues because of course there's no details there. But uh, first of all, uh, you, you know, you, Justin, you can, you, can, you can you can push me, but I can't answer it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, the company, uh, you know, you've been performing well. You've done well. The share price has gone up. You've had this strategic, you know. Uh, plan has been working out the last six months and you're heading towards profitability. Now, why have you decided to do a strategic review here? Yeah, the, the, you know, the reason is, is because the company has been performing well that we're undertaking this strategic review. So if you if you go back in the past seven months, we've made as a business has made tremendous progress. So we set out as a clear strategic path based on what we own, what we co-own and the communities we build for others. So with the we've launched the Gfinity Digital Media Group. We signed a multi-year deal with Formula One, a, a five-year JV with Abu Dhabi Motorsport Management. And you, we built out our tech, off, tech offering, IP offering, mm-hmm. which underpins what we do for the Premier League. So, you know, we're operating in a fast growing, highly attractive industry sector. And so we're now acting from a position of strength to go out and talk to people who are interested in coming on this journey with us so we've got big ideas and plans that would benefit they're going to benefit from joining forces with partners who share that vision and and have big ideas of their own and that's why we're undertaking this review yeah of course when something like this happens and people don't get all the answers they want they sort of worry and uh, people saying is the company in need of a fundraise is it unsure about its ability to deliver against the, the, the targets and all that stuff what would you say to that no, not no, not at all. As we you know, we said this morning, that we're on a firm financial footing after the fundraising that we did earlier on this year, and the operation operational improvements that we've been that we've been making week, you know, week on week, month on month. So our community is growing. We're creating outstanding partnerships. Um, the broadcast product that the team created for the V10R League. Is, is world class and which is why ESPN, BT Sport and others have signed up for it. So this is the right time from a position of strength to go out and talk to lots of businesses that have strategic interest in esports and competitive gaming and to see what makes most sense for the company and, 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 our, and our company and our shareholders. Uh, so the ultimate goal here is about accelerating growth of the business. Yeah, yeah. And do you know what? It's, it's amazing how hot esports is. I get an email every day about esports and just the number of companies 
entering you know, the, in the brands. And in fact, today, uh, IBM, the first time ever they got involved in esports, uh, I think it's a sponsorship or something, but everyone's sort of getting involved. So, you know, what type of businesses do you think, you know, would be interested in a partnership with Gfinity? Yeah, well, I think that's the beauty of the approach that, that we're taking. So us and our advisors, we've got the flexibility to explore all options. So it serves as an invitation for potential partners and possible partners in their interest to contact, to contact us as well with their ideas, people who may not even thought about. So the language we've used in the heading of the RNS allow these conversations to happen, whatever those conversations you know, may be. So the formal sales process language is not intended to indicate that a sale is any more likely than any other outcome. Yeah, the, the reality is there's nothing is ruled in and nothing is ruled out through this approach. So we want to explore how to take the business forward. And we had to include the formal sales process wording and followed the requirements of the takeover code to get the dispensations and flexibility to talk to anybody. Um, so there are multiple industry sectors that have strategic interest in what we do. And the Gfinity, you know, when it comes to the Gfinity boards, we, we look, we're going to look forward to seeing those uh, what those conversations and this process ultimately delivers and be to make a decision on where, on on, uh, on how to proceed okay all right so 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 i know you can't say everything here but what is your ideal outcome here from this process and, and what would be the time frame yeah for, for us here the ideal outcome is that we land on a decision which makes the best sense for all gfinity shareholders and stakeholders um that ultimately and i come back to this that helps us accelerate the growth of the business you know as for the time frame i think the process has only just started so it's too early to say um when we expect to announce announce any outcomes um but shareholders we will make sure that shareholders will be kept informed of all developments as we as we as we go on this journey yeah well someone asked me i think on twitter so why are they saying it now and I said, well, it's not selling. Is it? Listen, read the RNS. There, it's, 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 it's a couple of lines in there. It says, you know, the board of Gfinity, as a consequence, believes uh, the group's well positioned to diverse offering is now opting to, to, to basically significantly expand its growth projections, and it's within the, the, the interest of the stakeholders. So I said, and I said, you know, John has done well so far. I trust he'll carry on doing this. So I wouldn't panic. I think it's a good thing. You know, so people, it's just the uncertainty of it all. So um, if it, what happens if you don't? get a strategic partner or buyer then Jeff, Jeff, you know, as, as we've as we've sort of again i've enjoyed having these conversations with you over a period of time and, and, and go and talking you through and, and going on this journey you know we're we're a business with momentum you know, we've got a strategic framework and a plan that um, that we've that we've been delivering against and will continue to deliver against so we're entering into this this process from a position of strength it's all about accelerating growth um, and so the company's in a strong position, whatever the outcome may be. And that's what we're looking forward to for, sort of uh, progressing with. Yeah, I suppose so. It's, it's, listen, at worst, you, you are going to become profitable. <laughs> that's the worst case scenario. Is that you name any other company like that. Uh, at best, you may get to, you know, a, a big company coming on board. And so, so yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a win-win, uh, I suppose, in a certain way. But uh, it's very interesting. I know you can't say a lot, but... Uh, John, we'll look forward to catching up again. As soon as you can reveal some more information, uh, we'll speak then. Thanks very much. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. And joining me on the podcast right now is Anton De Plissi, CEO of Eris Resources. That's E-R-I-S, ticker. Anton, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Yeah, well, I haven't spoken to someone from Eris for a long time. It's, it's a lot of change going on. It's a different vehicle, of course, now. Uh, lots of different projects going on. So we'll get into that and uh, the detail. Before we get into you know, what you're doing right now and uh, looking forward, can you just summarize Eris resources and, and then tell people what it's about, please? Sure. So Eris, uh, to this point, has, has really been an exploration-focused company uh, looking at discovering and uh, but finding by way of transaction new projects to advance. Mm. Excellent stuff. Okay, and now you've got this transaction coming up, pros acquisition of a lithium project. Can you tell us about this uh, transaction, if you could, uh, Anton? Sure. So um, we've been looking for a for an advanced project for some time. Um, uh, ever since I've been involved with the company, we've, we've we've looked through quite a number of opportunities, and this one really stood out for us as being something quite interesting. So what, what we're doing is uh, Bacanora Lithium, which is a lithium uh, development company with a project uh, in Mexico, is going to reverse 
uh, their uh, stake in the Zinvolt Lithium Project, and I'll get on to what that project is in, in, in just a little bit, mm -hmm. into us in return for, for uh, a shareholding in, in Eris. At the same time, we're going to spin out our uh, Locte Gold project to existing shareholders uh, and raise uh, a, 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 an amount of new, new capital to mm -hmm. be able to advance uh, the Lithium Project going forward, mm -hmm. and that will become the core of of Eris. And to reflect that, we're going to rename the company Zinvolt Lithium uh, when, it, when the transaction completes. Okay, so you're going to be renamed uh, you know, Zinwald. And uh, so let's talk about this lithium project called Zinwald, if you could. To give us some more detail on that, Anton. Sure. So the project itself is located in uh, eastern Germany on the Czech border, about 35 kilometers from Dresden. And it it's a late stage project, so it's at the definitive feasibility study. Uh, Bacanora, when it was held by Bacanora, um, they undertook the study and completed that back in 2019. So, relative to um, some other projects out there in the lithium space, it is more advanced. It does have uh, an existing mining license, and um, our intention is to is to work with our joint venture partner to advance the project. Yeah, yeah. And, and tell us why, you know, you, if you are excited, why you're excited about this then? Well, I think lithium is an exciting space mm -hmm. and particularly in Europe. So they know they currently know uh, lithium producers in Europe. Uh, and a reflection of that is the EU only a couple of weeks ago put lithium on the list of, of critical metals to uh, encourage the, the production of locally. The whole auto industry is going through a transition to electric vehicles, and that transition is gathering pace. And the center in Europe for, for the auto industry is really Germany. So to be a lithium project located really in the heartland of the German auto sector, I think is going to be uh, an incredibly powerful um, uh, opportunity for us and, and an excellent uh, investment story. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at some of the figures there. I was going to say, when you said it's in Europe, because I know most lithium projects are based in Africa, sometimes in questionable jurisdictions. There's not a lot of transparency there. You don't know what the labor being used is, if they're, you know, if they're legal uh, labor. So that's very interesting. And I'm just looking at the figures here. Uh, it's a September 2020 feasibility study. Uh, Pre-tax discounted 8% NPV of approximately 428 million euros. It's a, a big old project. Internal rate of return of 24 Oh, uh, sorry, 27.4%, and an average life of mine annual EBITDA of 58.5 million euros. That's a that's a good sounding project, there, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, on the on the basis of the DFS, it it looks like an, an interesting and an, an economic project. Mm. Um, and you know, if, everywhere you look, uh, the winds of change are coming to to the auto industry, and, and, and that's a primary driver of demand. So uh, current lithium demands around uh, uh, 350,000 tons a year lithium carbonate equivalent, mm -hmm. and they forecast out there for that to grow, um, you know, up to the order of, of, of 2 million tons by 2030. So a lot, of, a lot of potential growth to come, and we want to be part of that. Yeah, and there's a familiar name uh, who's appeared on this podcast several times, actually, uh, becoming chairman. Uh, you may want to introduce him. Yes, our chairman uh, post-transaction is going to be Jeremy Martin, who's uh, also the CEO of Horizonte. Yeah, we've had Horizonte on, uh, and Jeremy on. I've uh, talked to him for years, Jeremy, so he's, he's, he's well onto the podcast and to the audience. So that's a nice, familiar name there. And so you're going to raise, uh, hopefully, what, 3.75 million before expenses. And can you say specifically, you know, what this will go towards then, uh, please, Anton? So the plan for the next um, 12 months is uh, to work with our joint venture partner. We, we will be, uh, we've committed to putting money into uh, expanding the feasibility study to include other uh, lithium, lithium products. Mm -hmm. um, to have a range of products and to be flexible is, is very powerful uh, in the sector. We're also going to be doing some of the um, more detailed front-end engineering work. We've got some permitting uh, work to complete, to complete the permitting on, on, on the mine. And uh, then we'll be having discussions with potential off-takers, potential finance providers, etc. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, if, and if you could say, you know, name a, a standard really milestone you're hoping to achieve in the next three to six months, what would you say it would be? I think we want to um, really sort of nail down 
the permitting to the extent we can. Obviously, uh, there will be some that will be dependent on sort of final engineering designs and construction. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that, that's that's a big step forward. And then, as I say, just advancing those discussions with uh, with off takers is, is 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 going to be key to the next to unlocking the next stage of financing. Yeah, absolutely. And I said you're located there in the heart of Europe's chemical and automotive industries, which is a uh, you know, it's very uh, important to be in that area. Um, excellent stuff. Okay, well, Anton, every day on the podcast, I highlight the top five most followed companies um, on the Vox Markets plat- platform. And to get on that list, of course, uh, several people have to hit that follow button. So please, if you could, give us three reasons why someone should hit that follow button on your page and add you to their watch list, please. Sure. Well, when the, when the transaction completes, we're going to be a company focused on, you know, what's a very exciting sector right now, lithium. I think it really is the uh, commodity du jour, um, uh, given all, all the reasons I've given around, uh, you know, how the industry is developing and, and, and the end, sort of outlook for in demand. So that's one. The second is I think it's the right project. It's an advanced project uh, relative to, to some others out there. Uh, it has a mining license. It's in the right country. It's located in in Germany, obviously very stable jurisdiction. Uh, It's the heart of of the European auto industry. It's also the heart of the European chemical industry. And so that means we've got access to excellent skill sets uh, right in the region where we're developing the project. And with lithium projects, that chemical expertise is critical to success. And then finally, I'd say we have the right combination of skills uh, within the company to advance the project. So we have a uh, highly experienced project team at the project level in Germany, led by uh, a very experienced gentleman uh, called Dr. Armin Müller, uh, who has uh, close to 30 years of experience in the industry and has been involved in this project for, for some years. And he has a team underneath him of, of chemists and uh, engineers who, who are well-placed to, to, to take the project forward. And then uh, at the ERIS um, board level, uh, you've got myself. I have long uh, experience of, of financing projects uh, uh, and corporate activity in the mining space. Um, and we have uh, on, uh, included in our non-execs people like Jeremy Martin, who is obviously developing a project in, in, in Brazil right now. So is you know very aware of of the challenges and and uh, mechanisms of 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 taking a project through development. So I think we we really bring together as a combined management team, all skills that are necessary to, to take this project forward. Absolutely. Anton, good to chat to you, and uh, you've got a lot to do, and it's going to be a busy period for the next few months, so hopefully we'll be catching up in the not-too-distant future. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. And joining me on the podcast right now is Paul Hill, equity analyst and full-time investor. Are you all right, fella? Yeah, morning, Justin. How's your, how's your portfolio been the last few uh, last, well, last weeks? <laughs> Same as last week to a certain extent. Uh, I mean, there hasn't been much change in most of them. Northbridge is still a bit weak. Uh, Leco Soft is where it is. Lloyd's has actually crept up. Taylor Wimpy's improved on the good housing data. Lo- um, Aviva has ticked up as well. Um, Equals, has, I think, has just actually had a, a, the clear out of, of, of the seller on the market. So that actually could be quite good news this morning. Somebody's dumped about 5 million shares at about, I don't know what the price was, but it, I'm just looking at the ticker. It looks about 22p. And if that's the case, then that's really good news because that was the sort of the, what we needed with Rosslyn. And Rosslyn, so somebody dumped on at 5p. And once we'd cleared that overhang, then it started to move. And, and Rosslyn's at about 6p. So overall, it probably hasn't moved a great deal from last week. I mean, as I say, I'm taking a longer term view. I'm pretty positive about uh, you know 2021. I'm, I'm surprised that you never seem to. Do you ever scale in? I mean, buy in tranches, or do you just go one big buy and that's it? If I can do a big buy, I tend to do it that way because I just find it's, you know, I'm happy to do it. You know, as a, as a get the whole position in at the start if, I'm, if I've done it. But if I've if I've got the strategy that I'm going <clears> to <throat> average down or average up and scale in, <clears throat> then I'm not that con, you know, I haven't got much conviction in it. As in like, I tend to go for stuff that I've actually, you know done a lot of research on and I'm happy to put a reasonable position on um, and that's how I normally play it. Um, I very rarely then buy later on even going up or going down unless the you know the, I can see huge amounts of value. Certainly I don't try and double down on things because if you're wrong then it can cost you a real lot of money um, and if I, if I have a smaller position then I will add add to it later on but yeah no I try and get the my position early on. I, 
I very rarely sort of like uh, sort of you know spread it over time. I just don't find that that works for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I see. I always do that. I because I, I mean, I, when I do a research on a company, I'll go in there and I, I, obviously you have to take a, 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 a sizable chunk for your portfolio um, mm. to make it you know have a conviction in it. Yeah, uh, and uh, and really care about it. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll say you know. I'll say, for example, I'll say I'm going to put 10% of my portfolio into this company, but not on one go, because while I've done the research and believe it may be worth this or worth this in the future, share price sometimes, as you know, is disjointed from the valuation quite a lot of the time. Mm. And the market will yeah. go down, you'll have a big sell-off in the entire market, all the, all the, uh, the tide will go out for everything. You think, well, hang on a sec, I didn't expect that to happen. So uh, and sometimes, and you, you see it, even in a normal year, you will see a good drawdown in the market, say 5%, 10% in, the, uh, in major industries. So those times... You can just take advantage, and even even if it doesn't happen in a major market, sometimes you'll see like like with equals, you'll see a, a seller for something for no reason, it not reflected with the fortunes of the company. It just mm. they'll just dump. You'll see these funds for some reason they've been in there or they, a change of management at the funds. You know, new fund managers come in and they're not into that kind of uh, small cap. They yeah. just dump it and they think, well, hang on, the company's going better. Why, why? And and and, and I've had lots of people ask me this, private investors. They'll say, well, if that fund's dumping, um, it can't be a good company then. I said, no, listen, ninety percent of the time a fund dumps, especially small caps. It's got nothing to do with the company at all. It's just the internal politics of the fund. And, yeah, and uh, it tends to be a yeah. great time to buy as well. Yeah, exactly. And when you get a big seller in there sometimes and you've been looking at the company. In fact, I tell you what uh, company you've been uh, mentioned, and I'm not involved in it, I don't know, but they've been on the podcast, and their share price has taken a hammering of it. It's, it's Chromec, because uh, yes. they've got a big a seller in there. Like, wow. And, it, and sometimes when you think it can't go any further, it does. And if you're in there and you've got a big position, it's quite painful, you know? So mm. um, sometimes that's why I scale in, because you never know yeah, who's selling. I mean, it's, your, it's your own particular work. What works yeah. for you to a certain extent. I mean, I, you know, I say to myself, I'm never going to, unless I'm absolutely pure fluke, I'm never going to buy at the bottom. I'm never going to sell at the top. Yeah. But if I'm happy in between to make a decent amount of money, then that's fine by me. And I take a, lo- a relatively, lo- you know, a much longer term view than you do. And on that basis, time is my sort of hedging mechanism. So yeah. if somebody's dumping on the market later on, I can wait that out. Yeah, it's a bit painful in the short term. But if a thesis is still correct, it will it'll come back. And I've many a time I've put a lot of money into a stock that is really, really undervalued, and then it's it's halved. And then, you know, you look at that, yeah. and you think, "Oh, crikey, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have bought at this sort of level." But 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 you just got to. That's sort of why. Take but you things. said that you can't get the top and the bottom of the market. But that's exactly why I scale in though, because like I said, you know, a lot, lot of the time share prices are completely disconnected from the valuation of the company or the potential future valuation of the company. So that's why I do it because you can't predict. The short-term volatility, you can take advantage of that volatility sometimes and just say, right, there we are. And, uh, you know, and I, I've, I've sat and held a small position in the company for quite a while, but I have it, I put a position in there because I like it. And then, um, mm-hmm. you know, and it'll, it'll, it'll move in the, in, the, in the right direction or wrong direction, depending on where you are. And I sort of topped up and, um, you know, I, I quite like that. Um, I kind of like that yeah. s- market sniping sort of, you know, if it dips yeah, ah, yeah. in, right? <laughs> I quite like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. I see you, have you scaled into um, on the market? I saw you sort of like deciding to buy in there or were you put a, a reasonable position on? If I was clever, I'd have bought, I'd bought in the dash for cash, but I wasn't as over it research-wise as I, that I was, mm. um, you know, later on. But I'm looking at the metrics there. And look at everything. Mm. And what's more encouraging, right? And apart from um, their, 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 their site visits, their deals uh, going up, everything like that, and, and um, you know, it's, it's all looking quite good. Um, even the fact that they, uh, obviously the market spend went down, but their cash position went up. It's all looking quite good there. And if you look at the you know comparison compared to the the, 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 the beer moth that is right move, you know, it's not nuts. They are ninety times the valuation of on the market, and on the market now, mm. not far off them as far as agents are concerned. I know they won't have mm. the margins that right move have, but. Do you know what's as encouraging as ever? When I first started, um, had the app of Right Move and on the market, I set up, um, you know, say a five mile search radius for house properties, house, uh, houses in my area. And when, when I first had that, and I've had the app for a while, uh, Right Move were delivering about, I say, two to one properties compared to on the market. Now they're pretty much neck for neck. And that shows me the stock levels on the market has gone up massively in the last few months. And they almost, I say, Right Move is slightly ahead. But you also get the new um, uh, properties coming out from on the market before Right Move has it. And I think that says a lot to me. That says they've got the stock. There are a lot more advertisers coming on board. 
and I quite like that. And obviously, we got the, the the results coming up next week, and I don't expect it to be a bumper set of results because they've given sort of uh, fee breaks or discounts to a lot during COVID. Mm. Yeah, it's the first half interim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I do believe they're going completely going in the right direction. And I think this next twelve months is an inflection point for them. I really they're catching up the market leader. I do believe that. You know, mm. what do you think they're worth? Well, you got a valuation for them at all? Well, exactly. Well, I, I say even if you if you look at I mean, bear with me a second. I just want to get that um, uh, at presentation. I did, but I, did a, I don't know if you saw the video I did, but I did a compare the metrics on right move. Oh, yeah, you, no, I've got, I've got them in front of me. I haven't got yours, but I've got mine. I mean, you know, you've got basically um, on the market at 90p on on a effectively EV revenue multiple of fully diluted um, of roughly around about 3.9 and, and and three if it's rev- if it's just a, a straight sort of, you know, reported um but, it, but 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 essentially if looking at the growth rate of the actual business if you push that forward into 2021 which is frankly what you know the the housing market is doing well and only take a modest sort of like you know well, 36 mil for revenue and they can certainly do a 50 million plus in the fullness of time mm. um then the multiple goes down to two and uh, 2.4 so if you take a modest sort of like you know three times multiple for next year, then you're probably looking at sort of like, you know, 140, 150 share price, um, even on the same sort of multiple. And that would still look very, very cheap compared to, to right move. So, yeah, I'm with you. There's still lots of potential upside there if the business model, you know, carries on. Yeah, and they're yeah. doing, uh, you know, they, they, they say in every single trading update, they're hitting record amounts of leads for their advertisers. Yeah, well, average leads per month, right? This is the last, last update they did. It was 149 leads per month. Right moves at 170. Mm. Now, if you look at right moves, you know, it's, it's 90 times the valuation of on the market. Mm. And I know they can't charge the margin because that's the whole point of on the market. You know, the, people, the, the, the agents were sick of the, of the fees that are paid to right move because mm. they, they're charging around about 1,000 um, average revenue per, per advertiser, about 1,000 yeah. for right move. It's run about, at the moment, last, because of the, the discount, 122 quid for on the market. They're hoping to get to 300. And that, mm. on that multiple, I, and I, also, what you, we, we can't really price in here is when you get to inflection point and pretty much they equal the same amount of advertisers as right move, a lot mm. of these agents who will own stock as well in shares of, uh, on the market will be saying, why have we got right move anymore? And mm. I think that almost ex- exponential rise in popularity of on the market will ha- will happen and then you'll see mm. the share prices going nuts so mm. I, I think this you know it's a massive market and I think the potential is, is very big uh, it, it's not a case of um, if they'll do it, I think it's just how long it'll take them because th- they've got all the agents on their side you know and uh, when right moves you know the crown starts to slip I think it'll slip quite quickly and um, and I just think it's a very exciting space to be in. You know? Yeah, like it's it. interesting who they actually take market share of. There's one argument to say, because a lot of agents advertise with two, yeah. and, they don't, and, they, and the two they go with is basically Right Move and Zoopla. Yeah. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether they take market share from Zoopla, because they're still cheaper than Zoopla, but Zoopla's at a much lower price point than, uh, than uh, Right Move. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. We, they're the cheapest ones on the, on the block, no doubt about it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and they're doing a great job. You know, I'm with you. There looks plenty of upside there. I wish I'd bought the same as you, but um, missed the opportunity. I did see one of the, your um, interviews earlier in the week was a really interesting company called Polarian um, Imaging. Now, the reason why I mention it, because I had a very uh, encouraging chat with a super smart, sort of like high net worth investor yesterday who put the slide rule over Polarian Imaging and actually had spoken to some seriously sort of like ivory tower medical professors out in the States to put this sort of like, you know, what their technology is forward. And, 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 and the sort of feedback came, which came back to him from the sort of like real medical experts in the sort of this sort of technology was that they thought it's going to be the de facto standard for diagnosing and treating pulmonary you know, technology, probably conditions in patients, yeah, yeah, and there's yeah. millions of people out in the state. So I don't know how what you got grasped from the, uh, you know, from speaking to the. To, I can't remember the CEO you spoke to, but uh, yeah, you'd be proud. You'd be proud of me here, Paul. I've I've held Polarian. It's my longest held stock. Oh, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So literally, you own it. 
Yeah, yeah, Saloni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to sell, cool. sell a bit of it. I mean, I had, I've had Richard on the podcast. He's been regular on the podcast, CEO of playing for ages. And uh, we've had, you know, he comes on at least once a month. And it I, must I, be a good winner for you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I think I did it on my last uh, update, but yeah, up over a sort of hundred percent on it. But I mean, um, well, not uh, bad. Yeah, but I've, I've averaged up as well. You know, I've averaged up because, um, yeah, it's huge. I mean, if you look at the compare, they did a phase three trial, and they had to do the phase yes. three because it was a, a drug device, but it's xenon gas, which is very stable. You breathe it yes. in ten seconds, it can show the lungs and the lung function, the gas exchange. Which at the moment, all you've got at the moment are these, you know, radioactive X-rays and all that stuff. Mm. And it can show you black and white still images. They've got this, you know, literally, it's 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 non radio it's non harmful to you at all. So you go in there, ten mm. seconds, you breathe this stuff in, hundred thousand times better image of the lungs than you've got at the moment. So their mm. their phase three was a c- comparison to that. Uh, and like I said, it win hands down, of course. Now they're going for FDA approval. They've applied for a priority review. And generally, yeah. you can't do that if, if you, unless you're novel, unless it's, you're in the market, nothing yeah, else is there. But yeah. they're arguing, because of COVID now, and they've had a good advice on this, they weren't going to go for it, but they were being basically told to go for it. Say, no, listen, COVID's changed the, changed the landscape. And they've been, apparently, they can't use, at the moment, they're not using the radiation, the old tech. Um, it's been stopped. So it's almost like this is novel. And um, so anyway, let's re- reduce the time till they get uh, approval. But the, the pulmonary market in America is like unmet need it is, uh, they've got here. And it's 150 billion they spend, the Americans spend on, on this area. Mm. And that's just in America. And I've, I've modeled out sort of, uh, you know, and I've, I've done videos on it a year back of uh, the revenue they can get just from America. Now you've got, obviously, Europe, then you've got the Far East, which is a lot bigger market. How come they haven't actually applied for, you know, approval or authorization from the um, the medical authorities in the UK and, and Europe? Because they're going to, they're going to have the first hundred, because they're based in America, and, and um, the first hundred institutions, tier one, they're going to go for in America first, then they're going to roll out elsewhere. But first, it's, it's, it's not a small company, or they've risen quickly, but, you know, they've got to... It, just Once they get FDA approval, the yeah. idea is to roll it out quickly. Yeah, and also that's a standard. Yeah. The FDA is it's pretty much the standard, so they know it can roll it elsewhere. But um, yeah. what's very interesting, right? This is very interesting. Jonathan Alice is the chairman, mm. and he sold his previous... He, these tech, this tech comes from GE. They both bought it off GE. Jonathan Alice, the chairman, bought his tech for a, a company called Blue Earth, it's called, and mm. he, he commercialised that tech, and it's uh, a similar field, but... A company called Bracca, an Italian company, bought yeah. his tech for $450 million, right? So he's now on the board of player and he's bought a lot of stock. Bracca has just come on the board last fundraise. They bought 8% of the company. And, mm. uh, and this tech is more commercial than the chairman's previous uh, tech that he sold for $450 million. So you can yeah. see where this is going. Bracca on board. They've got, they got a non-executive director on player in as well. And so uh, you can see it's only going in one direction. And they say, and, and even the CEO, the lovely guy Richard said, I hate to say, you know, groundbreaking and all this stuff, but there's nothing out there. The stuff that we're comparing to is 40-year-old tech. And mm. we are the next new thing you know so yeah so it's yeah, very I mean, that's definitely like, the feedback that this yeah. super smart investor got from a really big prof- medical professor out in the state that he thought he was going to be the de facto standard out yeah. there for this sort of like diagnosis and treatment I mean he, he couldn't sort of like uh, you know put it put it more highly into the uh, the, the therapeutic pathway out there in you know in the hospital so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, well, well I mean and it's, you know it's risen quite quickly of late and it's 82 million market cap now people think oh that's quite it's risen quickly but let me say one thing you you look around and look for a phase three clinical you know sort of med tech device drug company that's passed the phase three it's going for FDA below 100 million market cap and also with a mm-hmm. massive market and they are the market leaders or the groundbreaking market leaders that is cheap in my mind it's like this will go yeah. through the roof it's like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, yes, FDA approval's got to come, but that's, I think that's a formality, it's just time. Uh, but you yeah. won't find, even normal phase three drug, you know, uh, sort of producers, they're, you know, they're not below a, a hundred million market cap, you know. Phase three is, mm-hmm. is the big risk, you know, it's done. That risk is gone. Yeah. So, uh, what do you yeah. think of the, um, the the rise of infections, sort of like in the UK? And there's lots. Of, there's lots. There seems to be a lot of fear in the market. Yeah, the moment, that's it. I know. I'm saying. You know, I'm thinking now. Unlike the first time around, we didn't really know. I know. Do you know? I've said this a couple of times, but I think Trump, right? He wants. To, he's pushing. You know these these drug these drug companies to get results out before the election. He's trying his best, but the mm. FDA won't allow it. And drug companies are say, "No, we're not going to go." You know, it's been politicised. We're under a lot of pressure, but we will not go uh, or release data until we're ready to release. 
I think Trump has undergone his own clinical phase three trial. <laughs> it's like he's decided, <laughs> and I get COVID, and I take the drugs, prove to people I'm a clinical, you know, obese guy over seventy four, high risk category. I've got a cure for COVID. Done. And and uh, yeah. I think we are now within. I think Pfizer may release before election, but I don't think any others are. But um, I think we are within a month, two months of getting some really good data on the on the vaccines. And once that happens, you get a lot of stocks rallying, uh, like you know the, the hammered stocks in hospitality, leisure, and travel, all that stuff. But yeah, but of course we're going to have more infections. We're testing over ten times the amount of people we tested back in March, so we're going to get mm. more infections. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I, and the deaths aren't rising exponentially. I understand they have to put a lid on it, which is not a bad thing. But uh, I don't think we should be that worried about it. If, if you, you know, if you're healthy, young and healthy. Hospital- right. Hospitalizations are um, have, have ticked up quite a bit. I think they're doubling every yeah. two weeks. So I saw the headline. They're about 500 in the UK, in, you know, in total, just over 500. Yeah, but just um, give him what Trump's got. You know, the trouble is, the sad thing is, not everyone's got what Trump's got. He hasn't got seven doctors per, you know, per person over here. But like I said, what the encouraging thing is, there is medicines out there now that we know can deal with it. Yeah, you know? I would agree. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I'm, I'm the same as you. I mean, you know, I'm sorry, the 500 or 600 in the UK is just comparative to, you know, 2,000, 3,000, sort of like in March in the UK, March, April. So we're still a long way away. And we haven't got the, you know, the, the Nightingale hospitals, which are all available. Um, but with the drugs, people are going to be in hospital if they are hospitalised a lot you know, less than, uh, than they were you know, previously. So we've yeah. got capacity. It's just as a matter of, um, you know, sort of like getting through it to a certain extent. I did see the, G, you know, the GDP numbers come out were a bit softer this morning for the UK yeah. than, um, than expected. But again, I'm not phased by that. Because I think what people are, people, people see the big sort of ticket number and say, crikey, it's less than people thought it was and the economy is slowing down and all this sort of stuff. But to me, the important bit, and this, this sort of like feeds again into on the market, there's never, in, certainly in my living life, lifetime, been a prolonged recession in a housing market boom. Yeah, no, and, yeah. uh, you know, house prices were up 7% last month. Yeah. And there's unbelievable pent-up demand for, 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 for sort of houses and renovations and all that sort of stuff, which, which frankly will just drive the economy for next year, in my view. Yeah. And people who are still in jobs are still saving a lot of money. So next year, you're likely to get a double boost because the... They won't start pushing up taxes. The fiscal regime, interest rates will stay low and stay accommodative. Yeah, yeah. And you've got a lot of people who've got some discretionary spend. Who're going to go on mass. You're going to go on holidays and uh, and treat themselves to experiences that they've they've missed out for the last twelve months. Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, if you are looking for an opportunity, the opportunities here now are literally, like I said, a good business that you know was a bit expensive before, but now it's been hammered because of COVID, and it's maybe in that leisure travel industry. Maybe they got a bit more debt, but that'll be fine once the, it's get back to normal. That's that's the way to look around for some bargain stocks I think at the moment because I think we are within months of good news on a vaccine you know and that, that yeah. will raise, even sentiment even though the business won't repair overnight the sentiment will lift the market in those sectors I think you know mm. well and that's one of the reasons why I think equals has been I mean I, I don't know why this guy is selling or you know what or, or people are selling but I, but there's been a lot of press commentary on equals over the last couple of years really just from the daily mail and they make that connection that it's an, a b to c play it's the fair fx brand where people go abroad and of course you know there's quarantine measures and people stopping holidays it's probably made people sort of like who've bought on that back sort of worried but they don't realize that it's in the interim period it's pivoted to b to b and that's where it's making all its money and the, and the growth rates and the higher margins yeah, yeah. so what i think is just it's just all it is is they think it's one thing and actually if it was still that then yes it would be struggling but it falls exactly into your comment it's those stocks that have been being unfairly sold off because they are supposedly in the sort of like you know the, the holiday the overseas the travel type of sectors which it isn't anymore well it is but it's nowhere near as significant as it was because six three quarters of it or two thirds of it is is b to b um so i i just think it's that and it's just a temporary sort of knock um well, i mean yeah. obviously we'll wait and see i, don't, I mean i don't that, but that's the advantage some- but you know that's the advantage of being well researched isn't it you know when you get these sort of lazy journalists and it happens a lot you can see a company yeah. turning around or doing something different and you, if you look at the figures, you can see it's it's improving in the areas it needs to improve. And yes, there may be a drag from the older business, which people are looking at top line results, you know, and that's it. And they, they make that uh, judgment. But if you really know a business and you research it, you think, okay, so people are valuing this on the old business, and then and the new business is actually doing well, and it'll be valued on the new business in a year's time. By that time, in the share price will be a lot higher. You know, so that's that's the way it works, isn't it? Yeah. You know? 
Yeah. Uh, another, another, yeah, I mean, another thing sort of like as a, a rule of thumb for, for investing when you do your own research and it's always good to sort of kick the tires on certain things. Well, I think you've spoken to the same you know, it's a guy, but I spoke to um, Colin King at um, Omega Diagnostics earlier in the week. Yeah. Um, and, uh, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's obviously done very well. I mean, I wasn't in this. I wasn't, you know, smart enough to be in early, etc. But I wanted to sort of like, you know, put the slide rule over it and kick the tires on it. So, you know, I'm actually going to, I've, I've just done this morning the the food intolerance test that they do just yeah. to sort of test it out and i tell you it goes really smoothly you know it's not a problem you know you get it delivered you you, you basically to give it a blood sample and whack it in so i'll see what the results are like but i'm just giving that as an example if you want to sort of like there's there plenty of companies you can actually go and test yourself and just see whether it you know the product looks good and it, it feels good and it, and, it, and it works and you know I, well my feedback so far on uh, omega diagnostics is, is the product works absolutely well one of the products works absolutely Absolutely fine. Admittedly, most of the value is obviously in the in the COVID testing, which is the antibodies and the uh, the antigen testing, and I think that's going absolutely really, really well, um, and will do. You know, from the uh, from what Colin was talking about for, for next year. But it's also good. You can just keep. I only mention it as I say as an example that there are plenty of stocks you can do your own research or or obviously feed off other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what that that area the COVID testing? Of course, I've got, I got a bit of flack a while back saying. Now is the time to take profit if you made money on COVID testing stocks and maybe look around the leisure hospitality resort, uh, areas. Uh, and I got a, a hammering because they're so hyped. There's so many people believing they can be rich in that area because Novasite is, is, the, is the king of this area, right? Mm. In, 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 uh, in January the 30th, you could have bought Novasite for 17 pence. It's now mm. £8.26. Uh, and that, that uh, and they are and they are getting the contracts. They are literally doing yeah. triple digit, you know, million pound contracts from the NHS. And all that. They've got tests out there right now. The commercial they're selling, and every one of these COVID testing stocks now, people are saying this is the next Novasite. You know, or it's going to be better than Novasite. So the hype is in there. And, and, and mm. I, I'm thinking, it, uh, it was literally two weeks back they landed this deal, Novasite, with the NHS. It was like first of all it was 150 million. The next six weeks it'd be another hundred million. And they were valued at like four hundred million. I thought, what's what's going on? They just made a forty million, you know, uh, euro profit in the first six months. And last year they did a one point two million loss. And so, yeah. and this is on top of all this. And there's the other contracts going on as well. And yet they just, they've, just, they've just taken off again. It didn't really move that day. And yet there were companies like uh, Omega that were valued not far off their valuation. I thought, hang on. So yeah, I mean, Novus is 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 the, is the the poster child. And everyone yeah. else is, a, and I don't know how well it do, you know, when we get done, it may go on to do better than Novus. I don't know. But um, I'm just, w- some of these COVID stops are not cheap now, you know. The time to be getting in was like, uh, you know, March, early time. There. That was the time to get into them, really, you know. Or February. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or, yeah, yeah. Or, or if you rich up, then you'd have done very well. But hey, crikey, yeah, hindsight yeah. is a wonderful thing, yeah. isn't it? Have you seen any, have you sort of come across any other interesting stocks this week at all on your travels? Or uh, you just, uh, 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 no, I mean, the, ones I, I mean, the, two, the two one I looked at were, again, I mean, I only mentioned them, were sort of like VP who came out with a trading update, yeah. which basically do equipment rental, and, uh, and Chromic, obviously. And I think what's quite interesting is that, I mean, I posted some uh, summaries on uh, LinkedIn, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of serious smart money having a look at both of those businesses over a sort of like, you know, a, a, a two to three year time horizon. So I was just, a, I only mentioned it because... You know, if, if people want to have a good look at these, then it, now may be the time to do it because some serious bread is, is, is have, or serious eyes are definitely casting their um, their glare on those particular firms. It, it, Chrome, as we've talked about, is, you know, basically world leading technology again in sort of like, you know, imaging, et cetera, for um, various conditions for radio, radiology and stuff like that, and for all dirty bombs and um, uh, the medical, mainly yeah. on the medical side and, and, and security. And it's been hit because of, uh, because of COVID. COVID, but it should have a good uh, 2021, 2022. And VP has been hit again, like all of them have, like Speedy and HSS. Um, but it's coming back and again should have a, a good sort of 2021. But I just mention it because you can see on social media, there's some serious um, institutions and financial fund managers. And I won't name names, but there's a there's a lot of them having a good look at these businesses. So yeah. if people want to sort of have another chance to cast their eye, then, uh, then, 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 then have a look at them. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, it's not, listen, I, I will get this. This podcast will get listened a lot more now because we mentioned Amiga Diagnostics. Their RNS of the day has just had uh, over 10,000 views on Vox. It's gone nuts. Mm. You know, it's gone through the roof. The follow count has gone 
ballistic. So it's a very popular company. And I'm not saying testing is going to be around for a long time. And if they get that, the holy grail of testing, let's be honest, is that uh, do it at home, in your mouth, in 10 seconds or a minute, you get a result. Mm. And they're aiming for that. If they get that and they commercialize that or, one of the, or the group of people that they're involved with get that, of course, it's going to be massive. Because yeah. even, even, even though we have a vac- vaccine... It's going to take a while to roll out, and so we'll still need testing for at least six to twelve months. You know, so it's still a big. Well, market, the thing is, you know? we will still need testing anyway yeah. because the immunity, even if you get from yeah. a vaccine, is likely to be three to six months. And on that basis, to go on holidays and stuff, you might well need some sort of like uh, proof, a passport, or something like that that shows you've been tested and you're clear, or you've got the antibodies uh, to go abroad or to go to yeah. different areas and, and stuff. So I'm still, you know, it's like anything. I think we're, gonna, we're definitely going to need. Um, well, antibody testing, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Probably also antigen testing for those people who don't have a vaccine. Yeah, yeah. No, listen, I mean, some of those are amazing um, moves, you know, and I've just, I was a bit late to the party there, and I didn't, I didn't realise how long, really, the testing game would last, and it's going to be there for a long mm. time, you know. And like I said, that, that's, we will get to the stage where it'll be like a, you know, a one-minute test home, it'll be done, you know. It'll be a, a government certified, and it'll be fine. That's, that's the holy grail, isn't it? But uh, we've got to get there. Marvellous. Uh, anything else? Is that we've covered enough? I'm no, sure. I think we're there, actually. Yeah, I yeah. think it's good. <laughs> we're at the end point. Marvellous. Speak to you next week, you Paul. Yeah, cheers, Justin. Have a good weekend. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. Acquired something, didn't they? Yeah, they had, they had another deal, which I thought looked another good one. So um, they're back on the deal front. So I think that's probably good. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's that, really. That's good. Let's go for it. Uh, here we go. We've got FTSE 6000 as well we can chuck in if you wish. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, right, here we go. <clears throat> and joining me on the podcast right now is Chris Bailey, founder of FinancialOrbit.com. You are right, Chris? Yeah, very well. Thanks, very well. Happy now, that uh, yeah. FTSE is back at 6000 index points. My, it's hardly a great celebration when you remember that I think it was at 6,000 index points on the on the first business day of the year 2000 but but there you go <laughs> exactly I mean that's uh, I mean you know if you do hold a collective bunch of stocks like FTSE 100 as dividend it's, it's, it's a fund you've got to be collecting the dividend and reinvesting the dividend otherwise you've got nowhere basically you're just treading water you know so that's why dividends and dividend reinvestment is quite good um, cool yeah, uh, do, do you know what I was going to say but, then it's, it's, uh, sorry but go on yeah, but, but also, you know, it's fascinating. I, I remember back in 2000, I was, I was managing institutional money and whatever. The biggest stock at the time in the FTSE 100, nearly 10% of the index was Vodafone. And that yeah. was pushing forward. So, you know, it's funny how things evolve. And yes, the Vodafone business has changed and whatever. But, um, yeah, it's it's not just, you know, it, it's an index of stocks. That's absolutely true. But, you know, uh, picking and choosing and everything else really does matter for your portfolio. So, absolutely. I, I, I mean, it's like you're already getting the FTSE is an average, isn't it? So, you're getting the average. Of the, if, you, if you've got a, you know, a tracker fund of the FTSE 100, you're getting, you know, you, you're holding the worst stock there and the best stock there. And you're performing somewhere in the middle. So, you know, if you even just by cutting out some of the, some of the dogs you'll do a lot better you know that's right that's right if you can pick the winners and, and lose the dogs then yeah. um you should probably be a hedge fund manager but uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. apart from <laughs> you'll do all right i think but um yeah it sounds easy doesn't it we all know it's uh, a little bit more difficult than that but uh, all good fun that's yeah. that's the key but you've got to enjoy it you know if you want to manage your own money or part of your own money your own portfolio or whatever you've got to enjoy it um it's if there is a game element to it as well as you know serious stuff in terms of funding medium term wealth and spending um you know requirements and, and and things you want to live up to so yeah it, but but to me that's the exciting part of the markets you never know what's around the corner some yeah. people are scared by that Personally, I'm excited by it. You know, this is what this is what keeps you young. Yeah, yeah, and you know, when I see people like you know Buffett still, what is he, 19 or anyone still, still, you know, investing and enjoying it. I think that's the deal. That's part of the life. You know, you got to enjoy it and do that. So it's very exciting and. Uh, it's not about making money for him. It's about spotting good businesses and and proving that he can still you know invest at a good level and get a good return. You know, it's, and, and it is a game right. essentially. Yeah, and uh, and um, right. and what I like is yeah. you, you know you, 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 as long as your your mental faculty, faculties are all there, you can still do it until you drop dead. Which I, I love that. You know, sit in your own armchair oh, yes. and still invest. You know. Here's my theory. I reckon that um, who knows, I mean, Alzheimer's and related terrible, terrible things. Um, but it's like anything. It, the brain is a muscle. The more you engage it, the, the better your chances of battling against those things and yeah. um, and pushing it back and and everything else. So I reckon something like you know 
not the Sudoku and other stuff, fair enough. But investment, you know, that, that sort of fundamental analysis, few numbers, strategy, listening to people, interpreting what they're saying. I absolutely agree. You know, I look, I look at Buffett and Munger, both in their 90s now, uh, both billionaires many times over. They, they could have quit, you know, a generation ago and, and walked away with a huge sum of money. But but they don't. They love the game aspect, but I reckon it keeps them sharp as well. And, and that's got to be a good thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Marvellous stuff. Okay, listen, I want to ask you about um, Tesco. I know it was a couple of days back, but it's, you know, it's our biggest supermarket. It dominates the, I know, I, I, know, I know they're creeping up on Tesco, the challenges, but still I think Tesco holds around, what, 28% of the market share, which is twice as big as the next leader. So um, they've done quite well, haven't they? They haven't shouted about it because I know it's doing a, you know, awkward, difficult times for many, many people, but didn't they do quite well looking at the figures? Yeah, they did. I mean, look, there are two aspects of the figures that that need to be that need to be noted. The first is that historically, the numbers, the six months to the end of August, I think it was that they were reporting on, um, they, they they did a good job. And yes, the 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 business, overall profitability was impaired a bit by the bank, where there were a few extra losses, provisions, and related. A little bit by the Central European business, but the core UK business, now the absolute you know biggest and most relevant part of their business, did all right. And they did all right because, um, not just because we all went to the supermarket because of the lockdown and related, but Tesco's for a few years now has been on a wonderful kind of turnaround strategy. However, the architect of that turnaround, the guy at the top, um, uh, Tesco Dave, Dave Lewis, um, he obviously left just over a week ago. You got the new guy in Ken Murphy, good CV, uh, been at, at Boots or the, the, the parent company of Boots for, for a number of years. Looks like a great candidate. I think they, they've picked uh, somebody with, with good consumer and retailing experience. However, he is unproven. And you know he's got a big old challenge because the comps were pretty easy, let's face it, for Tesco's over recent years. And they did all the right things. They, they, they focused, they, they cut some costs they re reinvigorated their their consumer offering and related um and and now they've got to build on that so a good base but yeah now now the jury's out on how the new guy's going to get on but yeah, yeah you have to say on on the core uk business still firing on all cylinders and you're right there was some beneficiary of 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 the covid sort of food retailing uh, push however as the company again highlights they spent more money on extra covid related provisions in terms of ppe and extra staff and everything else than they allege that they saved through things like rent um, uh, rates, uh, sort of um, the deferral and stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it was a good set of numbers, but I'm not kind of surprised the shares got a little bit stuck because you sort of got a bit of a push-pull between the kind of historic good numbers and the fact the new guy is in and people are saying, you know, what comes next? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a case that um, I've never looked into the figures and broken them down individually in the in the financial reports, uh, and I don't know how they break them down. But um, online delivery, they don't make money. No one makes money at that. Is is that the case? Yeah, I mean, Tesco were the first in of the major ones. This is quite a few years ago, and they actually do claim to run a mildly profitable business. Um, and and that's because I think because again of their volume and throughput and understanding. However. Mm. Um, The thing about online, of course, is that it's complex because it's a distribution business per se. And those are always thin margin businesses. You look at kind of some of the some of the pure play distribution companies on the market. Um, But of course, if you're if you're kind of supplying it through what is known as a dark store, let's say that's a store which the public don't go for. It's just used for picking and, and filling online orders. Then obviously you're reducing your cost base a certain level, but that may go in another part of the account. So it's a bit complex. Bottom line is, um, the tipping point for Tesco's will be if if enough of us shift to online, how do they evolve and shift their store portfolio? That's mm. the critical thing. Yeah. And obviously, what you've seen is some of their bigger stores have been shutting. Even even Tesco's have, have been doing that. And obviously, they've been quite strong in convenience and what they have been building at the margin have generally been these sort of medium-sized stores or the convenience-sized stuff, which is much more akin to how we shop nowadays. So it's a complex one. You know, ultimately, are Tesco's indifferent? The answer is, of course, I'd love to have your business but by, whatever, by whatever means, but there will be an important tipping point in the future where they're going to have to say, OK, you know, are, are certain of our stores becoming uneconomic? And as a consequence, how do we how do we deal with that? So, yeah, it's complex. But as you can see by their numbers, they're doing all right in the UK. You know, profits up 
Um, profits and sales up sort of between six and eight percent on kind of a proper uh, comparable basis. That is not shabby. You know, that that's yeah. all right, particularly given, as I say, they took some extra costs in terms of COVID sort of provisions and new staff and ev- everything like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK, cool. Um, anything out today? Any news out today? Well, we got the London Stock Exchange. I mean, um, they, they've sold their, their their interest in Borsa Italiana, which is the uh, Italian stock market, effectively. And they've sold it to Euronext, which um, many, many listeners, I'm sure, will know. Euronext is the body which kind of owns a variety of the continental European exchanges, among others. Actually, some assets in the States as well, but France and, and the Netherlands and, and, and markets like that. So it's a little bit of a, a kind of a uh, an asset swap between index giants around the world, if you like. And it's all to do with the fact that the LSE themselves are trying to do another deal, and that is by a big sort of information and data company called uh, Refinitiv from uh, the Thomson Reuters organization. So lots of deals going on in the space. What what struck me, two things really. Number one is London Stock Exchange shares, which I don't own, but that was a foolish decision not to own them because they have absolutely romped over the last uh, few years. Um, and they've romped because... I guess there's there's a little bit of the fact that we we've we've all been trading and dealing a bit more. But the other reason is that the value of these natural monopolies, you know, you don't have um, sort of competing exchanges generally in 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 one country so much. I mean, they can obviously be in the states. You've got Nasdaq and the NYSE and whatever. There, there is a little bit of competition, if you like, over there. Although different companies tend to sort of head in different ways. Here, of course, it's a lot more orderly. You know, if you're a large cap company, then most of them are going to go straight onto the LSE, and if they're not, they're going to be on the AIM market. And still, it's all kind of under that umbrella, really, of the London Stock Exchange Group. So, it's it's a bit of a natural monopoly, but it's all about data. And obviously, data and and trading put together is pretty powerful. And these stocks have been hugely loved around the world. You know, you look at all of the exchanges, Hong Kong Exchange, the aforementioned NYSC or other futures bodies and whatever. All of these companies have been really bid up in valuation. So shares are romped, massive valuation. They've sold the Italian bourse interest for 16 times EBITDA, which is a big old multiple. Mm. Um, but they're hoping to do a, that that deal with uh, Refinitiv at an even bigger multiple, if I recall. So yeah, expensive stock, natural monopoly, um, data driven, which is obviously very on message at the moment. I don't know. I, I don't own it, but I do observe that the market quite like the, the announcement today because it brings this new deal for them, the Refinitiv deal, a little bit closer to potential completion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Marvellous stuff. Uh, cool. Hang on, let me just look at the, look, try and look at the chart there. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's gone because there were, if you go back a few years, some, some listeners may remember that Deutsche Borsa, the German stock exchange effectively, um, they were kind of in talks, very detailed talks to merge potentially or to take yeah. over effectively the LSE. And the shares were, I'm trying to remember now, 30, 40, 50 pounds at that point. They're now pushing 90 quid. And so you see how it's cracked on. And um, yeah, it's, if you hold it or been owning it over that period of time, well done. Yeah. Is what you spot was, was a natural monopoly and people's propensity to pay up for such businesses. Yeah, you, you could have bought them for like, um, you know, on the, on, the, on the cheaper side of 10 quid back in 2012, end of 2012, 2013. And now they're like uh, 88 quid. Nice return. Yeah. Nice return. Uh, lovely stuff. Uh, okay, what's next, uh, Chris? Well, if LSE is, has been performing well, British Land and all the big listed property companies have been the other way, obviously. British Land still trading at about half times book, which is not good. Come up, out with an announcement today, an operational update. A couple of interesting points from it. The good news, if you're a shareholder, and this is why I think the shares are up, they're reinstating the dividend, which, which sounds good, although they're linking it with earnings per share, which makes me think that the kind of the headline 8% yield I saw on one website on British Land uh, shares the, the, the alleged uh, forward dividend yield, I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be a fraction of that when, when reality hits. Um, unsurprisingly, I think the earnings per share line on British land is going to be pretty mixed uh, going forward. The reason for that is there were some unbelievably 
insightful stats actually on on rental collection so just they collected just over about 74 percent of the rentals for the period to to the the quarter to the end of june you recall that a lot of the rental collections are quarterly in kind of big retail and whatever um properties for the september quarter which obviously has only just occurred only just finished um they're still under 70 percent collection and there were some amazing stats you know very low collection rates in in certain types of businesses um and then even more galling or kind of insightful going forward is that they gave some utilization stats and i believe if i recall it was just 18 percent of their offices in in their sort of london-based portfolio were currently being utilized which, which you know is is striking and to me this is like a slow car crash isn't it sadly where you know covid is is clearly horrible and everything else but there's a structural issue here on top of that and that structural issue is people are finding technological ways to work and think and everything else and particularly for offices you know professional let's say financial service or other other service sector business do you really need that office anymore do you certainly need as big an office and the answer probably is no you don't so for british land that's a bit of a bit of a problem and that utilization stat is kind of striking because that tells you unfortunately your your, your rental levels and everything else looking forward uh, are going to be impaired so half book i'm afraid that sounds cheap doesn't it but Mm. you know there are there are risks associated with that yeah exactly Uh, the landscape is changing and um do you know i've seen a couple of uh is company i own actually who are they they, they, into escape rooms and they're saying now they can afford properties in tier one uh shopping centers or central locations they couldn't pre-covid uh, and, and landlords are desperate to get people in and they're offering them incentives and all that stuff so yeah you can see the issues they're having aren't they they can't just fill that they can't fill their retail outlets people are just leaving everywhere and um they're not paying <laughs> and i i know so many companies and in fact that company as well has also said we're not now going to re-rent our office <laughs> our centrally located office because we can work from home so they can cut the costs that way and they get offered better deals on their actual you know the businesses uh, properties so yeah it's all going in one direction isn't it really and and if, if you look at the british land numbers and observations you know unsurprisingly their their utilization stats for food and beverage businesses is a lot higher of course it is because clearly by definition most of those cannot trade trade remotely unless they're going to go fully into e-commerce um but you know it's deceptive isn't it because unfortunately they're impacted you know they themselves will they be looking to cut rent deals you bet they will be if i owned any form of business and had a property an office um if i couldn't revise the rent right here right now next time it comes around what what are you going to do you're going to look to halve it or something and you're pushing on an open door so it's tough times for British land. You know, they've got to find some alternative uses. They've got some good tier one properties. But as you say, um, maybe they need those escape room operators to lock people in, quite literally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Marvel stuff. Is there anything else up there, uh, to talk quick, about? Quick, quick, quick one on Biffa. Oh, yeah. Biffa. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen their trucks and um, rubbish collection units and whatever else in obviously the uh, the waste and related uh, area. And Biffa, I think it's a really nice company, actually. It came to the market not that long ago. Um, they did raise a bit of money back in the dog days of the of the peak lockdown period just to ensure that their balance sheet wasn't too stretched. I think, think that was quite wise in hindsight. Um, but for me, it's a sort of business where there's quite a lot of – they're good at what they do. It's it's an area with a bit of barriers to entry, particularly in the more industrial waste sort of area. You can see some obvious cyclicality if you have if you're picking up industrial waste or consumer sector waste or whatever. But you know it's a bit of a repeat business. Lots of lots of re- reoccurring contracts and whatever, um, even in the municipal waste space. Um, they keep on doing these little deals to supplement their portfolio quite a big one announced today uh, about 35 million quid was the consideration but again the multiple is reasonably low kind of um low teens uh, forward multiple um looked like a sensible acquisition to me so for me biffa shares still look pretty cheap in the wider scheme of things it is a recovery play no doubt on the broader economy because the busier we are in terms of gdp and whatever the more waste we produce that's that's the way it goes but actually there's a a few kind of regulatory and environmental drivers to it as well so um yeah might be for shares uh, they raised money at two quid a few months back pushing a little bit higher than that now back 230 pence i can still get you know 
perspective prices in the 250 300p range without working too hard so um yeah i like them one, one not to put on the rubbish heap i would say hey all right, marvelous stuff uh and the ticket is biff isn't it biff B I W S Biff, yeah, yeah no, what, a, what a great ticker. Um, indeed. In fact, the chart is looking quite good. I mean, you know, it hasn't really recovered that much from the, the big fall. I mean, they, 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 were, they were three quid pre COVID. The big sell off took them down to sort of uh, 166. They bounced back up to 260, and now they come back on two quid, but they've been bu- bumping along two quid, but they're sort of starting to climb a bit now. So it looks like a, a, a almost a decent recovery there, you know, from this level, maybe. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's it's a confidence game, isn't it? Mm. Balance sheets in more sensible order now. They are inherently cash generative. What they've got to do is you've got, they've, you've got to put something on the table to say, our business is starting to recover in terms of utilisation and contracts and revenues. The fact that they're striking deals now, I would kind of suggest, is a, is a nod towards normalcy is kind of coming back. So, uh, fingers crossed for them. Yeah, marvellous stuff. Chris, speaking next to Wiki. Sounds planned. See you then. OK, it's time for the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours. They are at five. Tizian Life Sciences. At four. Rolls-Royce Group. Tizian is down 8.3%. Uh, Rolls Royce is up 14 or 15%, 223. Um, at three, Asia Vet Resources up at 9.3%, 4.7. At two, Deep Verge Group up 1.67%, 30.5 pence. And at one, Gene Drive up 7%, 8.5 pence. All right, top five most liked RSs are as follows. At five, it is Alien Metals. Completion of programs at Hammersley Projects, up nine percent on that. Uh, at four, Extract Resources, Manika Hard Rock Project update. At three, Polarian Imaging, Holdings and Company, uh, Tyndall Investment Management has gone from three to four point one percent. And uh, at two, it's uh, what Gfinity Strategic Review, and uh, that's um, well, it's up to date, obviously thirty percent. On that, and we talked. John talked about that on the podcast at four point three pence. And at one, uh, most liked RNS is a virtual analyst in investor event, and uh, that is uh, from Amrit Farmer, and that's uh, non moving day two pounds seven pence. That's it for the podcast. Thanks for listening. Much us appreciate. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research.